Over the past few years, there has been a clear change in direction for the United States and Britain. Optimism is riding high as trade deals are in the works. Stock values are going up, oil wells are sinking in, jobs are opening up, and for certain terrorists, missiles are raining down. Some commentators see this new direction as a rather sudden and dramatic resurgence for the two brother nations. And it is. It was prophesied. But we should know that the Bible also prophesies of much trouble coming upon our nations. And this too will happen suddenly, at an instant, the Bible says. Are you prepared for this prophesied calamity? Hello everyone and welcome back to the program. We're now about 100 years on from the Roaring Twenties, the 1920s that is. What a boom that was, especially for the United States. Paul Johnson in his history says that it's hard to point to any aspect of culture in which the 1920s did not mark spectacular advances. A spectacular event, technology boom, there were jobs, people had money. The stock market was booming, entertainment, sports. Of course, there was also lots of debt and wild speculation to go along with it, and immorality, for sure. And then we all know what happened at the end of that decade. 1929, you had the stock market crash, and then the Great Depression followed that, and then all of the troubles in the 1930s, the era of appeasement, the trade wars, the rise of authoritarians, the Nazi war machine, and finally then the, the world war that started at the end of the 1930s. I want to begin our study today in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 2. Go and get your Bible and read along with me and see what the Bible has to say about just how suddenly things can change for the worse. That certainly happened back in the 1920s and 30s. For a time, it seemed like the boom was just going to go on forever. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5 here in verse 2. It says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. In other words, it comes at an unexpected hour. People don't expect the return of Jesus Christ. Of course, many people today don't even believe it will happen. But they're just carrying on. Jesus said it's going to be like in the days of Noah, before the flood. People were just carrying on with their lives, their immoral living. And then the flood came. Notice verse 3, it says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. See, sudden destruction comes. Suddenly, another translation says, catastrophe will sweep down upon them as suddenly and inescapably as birth pangs to a pregnant woman. It just happens instantly. Verse 4, it says here, But you, brethren, are not, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You see, God's people should know. If you're watching world events, if you're praying always, as Jesus said, then you should know on today's program. I just want to encourage you to plan and prepare for the trouble ahead. There is trouble coming. Jeremiah 30 talks about a time of Jacob's trouble. Jesus prophesied of great tribulation. That's ahead of us. No matter how, how great it might seem now, if we are in the midst of a temporary resurgence, it's exactly that, just temporary. We should know better, though, based on all these prophecies. Look at what we should know. Verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Let us be alert spiritually. We have to stay awake spiritually during good times and bad times. We want to be following God's lead, His direction, making sure that he's right at the center of our lives. Let's notice uh, one of the Gospels, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13. Let's see what Jesus said here about the last days. This is verse 34 
of Mark 13. It says, For the Son of Man is, a, is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. And so he's away. The Son of Man, it's like he went off on a far journey. But uh, he's coming back, as we well know. Verse 35, Watch you therefore, for you know not when the master of the house comes or returns at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Here again, the emphasis on this word sudden or suddenly. He says, you better, be, you better be paying attention. You don't want the return of Jesus Christ to catch you unawares. You want to keep watch. You want to be vigilant. You want to know when we're close, when we're even at the door. Verse 37, it says, And what I say unto you, I say unto you all, watch. See, watch and pray always. Watch so that we'll be ready. That's the way it's worded in Luke 21. We want to be ready for the return of Christ. We want to be prepared for what's coming. We want to have the faith to endure. Notice what Herbert Armstrong said back in 1947. This goes way back, but he's talking about the coming trouble uh, on our nations and how it's foretold in your Bible. It's foretold by Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, Micah, and others. It was foretold by Jesus Christ himself. He says, But the worldly churches and their ministers, all divided into sects and denominations, bound by sectarian creeds and blinded by worldwide spiritual deception, deceived, deceived by a devil who poses as God and has deceived the whole world. That's in Revelation 12, of course. He says, they do not understand the Bible and do not perceive what is so clearly prophesied. You just don't hear this from the, the churches of this world, traditional Christianity. That's what he's talking about there. They don't get into these prophecies. They, they talk about smooth things. They tell you what you want to hear. But they don't talk about some of these verses where it talks about sudden destruction, where it talks about great tribulation, where it talks about Jacob's trouble. It says, yet this catastrophe is sweeping on toward an unsuspecting America with increasing momentum. And in a few years, it will strike suddenly, unexpectedly. As a snare, said Jesus, will this sudden destruction come? Then it will be too late. You don't want to wait until it's too late to act. Well, there is time, even if it's just a little time. You want to make sure that you act on this precious knowledge. This next passage we'll look at, this is Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah 30 and verse 8, God tells the prophet, now go and write this down, this vision. Write it on tables. Make sure that you preserve it because it's for uh, a time to come. It says it's for the last days. And then continuing, verse 9 says uh, that this is a rebellious people. So this is the warning message that the prophet recorded. Lying children, children that will not hear the law of the eternal, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, Prophesy not. They say to the teachers, don't teach us. They say to the prophets, don't prophesy. Just let us continue on the way we've been going. Prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Don't tell us the truth. Don't, don't tell us the painful truth or the, what they would consider to be the negative, discouraging truth. Just give us smooth things. Tell us everything's going to be okay. Prophesy deceits. They want to be deceived. They don't want to hear the truth. We'd rather persecute the messenger bringing truth than to actually accept the truth of God. Look at some of the history from, again, that period during the 1930s, the period of appeasement and how people just didn't want to hear the truth. They wouldn't receive the truth. They wanted smooth things. They wanted false doctrine. Verse 11, it says here, Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, 
cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. I mean, this is actually aimed at, at God's people. These are God's people turning away from the Holy One of Israel. These are the people of God that have gotten lukewarm in these last days. They had all this valuable instruction, this precious truth revealed to them by God through His servant, Herbert Armstrong. The truth about God's plan and purpose, about the, the identity of the United States and Britain in prophecy. We're offering that book uh, here today on the program. This is a, a book, by the way, we went through six years of litigation to, to be able to send this out to you free of charge, without cost or obligation or follow-up. You can just contact one of our operators during the break or at the end of the show and request this book. Herbert Armstrong's classic work, it went to six million homes around the world. A lot of people know about this message. A lot of people have since forgotten this truth. They say, my Lord delays his coming, so it must not be true. Your Bible says there's going to be a sudden turn, a sudden change, a sudden change in direction. And we need to get ready for it. Verse 11 again, get thee out of the, out of the way, the Holy One of Israel. Let me just read this quote from the Winston Churchill booklet my father wrote. He's talking about this verse, Isaiah 30 and verse 11. It ought to shock any person who believes the Bible. Here is a group of people among whom the Holy One of Israel dwelled, and now they want God to stop leading them. They knew the great God and then rejected Him. This is the greatest possible catastrophe. What a great catastrophe it is to reject the truth and to believe lies, deceit, one final verse or two verses, it says, Wherefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking comes suddenly at an instant. It all comes crashing down, just like the boom did in 1929. Suddenly, at an instant, on that black October day, everything came crashing down. It's time for us to sit up and take note, to open our eyes, to be awake, spiritually awake and alert, vigilant. And we want to respond to these prophecies of God. And we'll talk about some of the action that we ought to take following the break for now. Jot down the phone number on your screen and request the United States and Britain in Prophecy. And then also this wonderful little booklet, this sobering little booklet by my father, Nuclear Armageddon is at the door. We haven't offered this on uh, the program that often. Uh, so make sure if you don't have a copy, you request your free copy today. And while you're at it, make sure you also subscribe to our monthly news magazine, uh, The Philadelphia Trumpet. We'll be right back. Genesis 41 tells the history of, of Joseph in Egypt and this, uh, this dream that uh, the Pharaoh had. And he brought Joseph into his presence and told him the dream. And, and Joseph uh, gave the Pharaoh God's interpretation. And he said that there would be seven years of plenty, seven years of prosperity, but that it would be followed by seven uh, very difficult, grueling, hard years of famine. And so what did they do? Well, the Pharaoh gave a lot of responsibility to Joseph, God's servant, to prepare for those lean years, to prepare ahead for the crash, to prepare ahead for when the boom times would be over. Now you think about that lesson and some of these prophecies that are written about in Mr. Armstrong's book, the U.S. and Britain in Prophecy. Here's one quote. He says here, this, uh, this most am the most amazing fact of all history is this sudden skyrocketing from virtual obscurity of two nations to the most fabulous wealth and economic power ever possessed by any people. Britain became Great Britain, a, a gigantic, stupendously wealthy commonwealth of nations, the United States, the greatest nation of history. He goes on to say, more amazing still, 
are the unbelievably shocking facts of the present of how and why we are losing it faster than it came. You see, God's taking it away faster than we received it. That's pretty sobering. You can, even if, uh, if you're in the midst of a temporary resurgence, you still see all the signs of trouble ahead. You see ascendant powers, adversaries for the United States and Britain. You see astronomical debt. You see gross immorality. You see bitter division within our nations. There's still lots of troubling signs, even if the economy surges or there's more jobs at the moment or there's better trade deals to be made. If we're watching and praying, we certainly see the troubling signs there as well. We're going to continue our study in 2 Chronicles 29. This is uh, talking about Hezekiah's reign in uh, ancient Judah. 2 Chronicles 29 and verse 1, it says, Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old. So he started as a young man, twenty-five years of age. And he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Eternal, according to all that David his father had done. So he looked back at the glorious history that was there in Israel during the days of King David. And he was able to, uh, to set off a resurgence in Judah by getting back to King David. He got the kingdom of Judah back on track, you could say. And he started in immediately when coming into office. It does show, my father's made this remark before, just how much one man can accomplish, even when he's surrounded by evil. Well, look at Noah as an example. Or I mentioned Joseph. Standing up for God, acting on God's truth, even when surrounded by by a lot of evil and, and negativity, a lot of sin, we still can make a stand for God and really act on this precious truth, act on these sobering warnings. Verse 3 says, He in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Eternal and repaired them. So he, he didn't waste any time. He got busy in the first month, in the first year of his reign, and he started to clean up the house of God. He started to clean up the house where God dwelt. That's a, that was a very important task that he took on. He really wanted to worship God, to bring purity into the house of God, purity and cleanliness. Verse 11, further down, it says, My sons, this is him educating his priests, uh, those helpers that were helping him with this project. He says, My sons, be not now negligent, for the Eternal has chosen you to stand before him to serve him, and that you should minister unto him and burn incense. He's telling his assistants, don't be negligent. Catch fire, spiritually speaking. Carry on with the work, this, this cleanup project. Get excited about it. Put your heart into it. He tried to help these priests and Levites to just better appreciate the tremendous responsibility and opportunity that God had given to them. And they, so many of them, really did take his admonition to heart. It was a great response. And of course, that's what God wants from you. He just, he gives you these messages. He gives you these admonitions. He gives you this encouragement. And he wants for you to act. He wants for you to respond. Verse 16, it says, And the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Eternal to cleanse it, and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Eternal into the court of the house of the Eternal. And the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook Kidron. It says, And now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify. And on the eighth day of the month they uh, came they to the porch of the Eternal, so that they sanctified the house of the Eternal in eight days. And in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. So they, they got involved. They removed all of this this filth, all of these vessels used in idolatry, all of the remains of idolatrous, idolatrous offerings, they just had to get it all out, purify the place from top to bottom. And then down in verse 31, it says, Then Hezekiah answered and said, Now you have consecrated yourselves unto the Eternal, 
Come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings unto, into the house of the eternal. So now that you've done this, he said, go in and, and, and let's give thanks to God. Let's bring all of these, thank, these offerings of thanks and show our appreciation for being able to serve God in the work. What an attitude. What a spirit. Verse 31, it says, But the priests were too few, so that they could not flay all the burnt offerings. Uh, wherefore their brethren, the Levites, did help them till the work was ended, and until the, the other priests had sanctified themselves. For the Levites, it says, were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. See, the priests were too few, and so uh, uh, they had to bring in some, some Levite, Levites to help. And that's always been the case with God's work. It's called a little flock in the New Testament. And, and there's always been this manpower shortage. We need people like Hezekiah who come in on the first day, the first month, the first year and really get busy doing the work of God. And here God even says there were some that had their hearts into it more than others. That's always been the case because we're free moral agents. And some are more willing to act on the truth of God than others. Others just like to hear it maybe, but they don't do much with it. Think about what, what, what God's work would do if everyone who heard the message would just take it and run with it and go forward. That's what God wants of us, but He can't force us to do it. He wants to see you do it. He wants to see you decide. Notice verse 35, it says, And also the burnt offerings were in abundance with the fat of the peace offerings and the drink offerings for every burnt offering. So the service of the house, notice this, the service of the house of the eternal was set in order. What a turnaround, what a transformation. It says, And Hezekiah rejoiced, and all the people that God had prepared, uh, that God had prepared the people, for the thing was done suddenly. See, they brought on some pretty dramatic changes in a short period of time. This is what God wants of us. The emphasis God puts on the end of this chapter, the speed the pace with which they did the work of God. It's easy to sit back and to say, well, when the time is right, when I feel right about this, when I've got the proper plan in place, when these obstacles are finally removed from the, equa the equation, then I'll finally do something in support of God's work. Then I'll finally take some action. But here God is saying, don't wait. Don't wait. All of us can be pricked in our hearts when we hear a stirring message and think, even during the message, all right, I, I need to make this change now. I need to do this this moment. And then what generally happens is we don't make that immediate change. We don't take that immediate step in the right direction. And then we just revert back to the old ways, those old ruts. God says here, don't wait for the right time. Don't think, well, when I get around to it or when I can finally work it in. Time is too short for that. There's some very sudden and dramatic changes ahead, prophetically, or, or, or talked about in Bible prophecy. And our goal, our objective is to prepare for that, to make ourselves ready and that requires taking action. Now, look at how much can be done. Suddenly, as it says there at the end of 2 Chronicles 22, that's very encouraging. This uh, literature will give you some further admonition and encouragement. The United States and Britain in prophecy. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, nuclear Armageddon is at the door. It's right at the door. We've got to be prepared for it. We've got to be ready. Make sure you also sign up for or subscribe to the Philadelphia Trumpet Magazine. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.